Gannon Stauk was just 11 years old when he disappeared. His own stepmother now charged with his murder. Our sister station, KOAA, has more for us. For a while now, we've only had bits and pieces. We can see a picture if we only have half of the puzzle. But now, a picture becoming more clear no matter how devastating the details. There's a significant pool of blood. There's blood splatter. Uh, there's blood on her car. Attorney Stephen Longo weighed in on the unsealed arrest affidavit for Letitia Stauk. It really shuts the door on any potential credibility she might try to have. It all started January 27th when Gannon stayed home from school with his stepmom, Letitia. Surveillance shows them leaving the home around 10 they get back after two. Letitia's phone was left at home the whole day and not unlocked until around 30 minutes after she returned. Then right before five, a text sent to her daughter asking for cleaning supplies. Detectives say are commonly used to clean blood. Then just before seven, Letitia calls 911 saying Gannon never came home from a friend's house. Documents show that would be the first of many scenarios she shared with detectives in the days to come. Investigators believe Gannon was killed in his bedroom between 2 and 5.30 that day. I think the only potential plea agreement would be a matter of efficiency for her to plead to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Longo says that's the best option for the defense, which also has to account for a defendant who showed strange behavior after her stepson's disappearance, like washing her car before a police interview and bringing notes to it along with giving alibis and excuses for certain evidence that hadn't been revealed to the public yet. <coughs> Detectives also believe Letitia initially tried to dispose of Gannon's body January 28th near Perry Park. They found evidence that had been there, but was later moved. That arrest affidavit, so full of details, and none of these details obviously help Letitia Stout as, as you go through them page by page by page. Let's bring everyone back in. And Seema, I know today you had an opportunity to speak with one of the neighbors who, who gave you um, that surveillance video that he shared with investigators during this case. Uh, tell us a little bit about the video first. Okay, so th this neighbor has provided us a wealth of information, but also confusion when you compare it to the affidavit. The video shows uh, that red truck. And you have Letitia Stouch and how is the neighbor described a drugged out appearing Gannon getting into the red truck. And this is about, I think he said actually 10, 13 a.m. And then the truck returns. And this is what he said at 2, 19 p.m. Letitia gets out and Gannon does not get out. So this is why it's very confusing. And then I spoke to him, Vinny, actually, before we went on the air to confirm all of this. Uh, Roderick Drayton, the neighbor, and there's one house in between his house mm -hmm. and the Stouches. He is saying to me that he watched this video 30 times. And he watched it with the FBI. And he is certain that he never saw Gannon get out of the truck. Now, I want you to keep in mind that at some point he had turned over his password to the surveillance video, all of that video to the FBI, and he didn't really look after 219. So I think that is what we're waiting for, is to find out, did the FBI find anything on that video after 219 p.m. that implicates uh, Letitia Stouch even further? Yeah, uh, Ted, this is, this is the, uh, again, a little bit of an inconsistency. At the time when this video was, was first released, everyone thought, okay, this is it. So uh, she drives somewhere and he is gone. Uh, but now they're saying the time of death is after he returns, yet he's not really seen on that video. Yeah, so obviously authorities know more than we do, right? So they, she must have left, came back without him. Where was he at that point and when did he come back in? Uh, because they believe he was killed in the house, and the physical evidence seems to support that. A lot of questions, and you wonder if, in a twist, when we get to trial, if the defense is going to try to use this video to their advantage. Yeah, exactly. Let's take a listen to a little bit of what Roderick uh, Drayton told Asima earlier today. So I started looking and looking. I stayed up half the night just looking and looking and looking, look, looking from frame to frame to frame to frame until I saw Sunday, the kids were outside playing. She picked them up. I could hear her tell Gannon, Gannon, you get on this side, Lamb, you get on the other side. 
And they drove away. And, they, and I watched him. They came back. He got out of the t- car. He took off running to the house. And so and that Monday I saw him. I saw a get. I saw a walk to the truck, back up. And then I saw Gannon come out of the house. And I was like, man, he doesn't look right. He doesn't look like he did Sunday. Because Sunday he was running and playing. And he looked like he was struggling. Like I said, like he was drugged or something. Because he just could barely move. He got in the truck. And they left. So I just kind of went through the videos to see what time they came back. So when they came back, I saw she get out of the truck. She, I, I can hear her lock the door when she got out of the truck. And I hear the garage door opening. So she got out, she locked the truck, and went in the house. Julie Grant, this part of the, of the mystery becomes very confusing. And, and I think Ted might be on something here. I mean, if, it, if there is any sort of level of inconsistency, that's something that the defense always pounces upon. You know, and sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't. But it just doesn't, the story's not quite making sense right now. Yes, Vinny, you and Ted are exactly right on that. The defense is going to jump all over this. Uh, However, I I would caution anybody from jumping to a conclusion just yet because one thing is, do we know if that time on the video is exact? Because if this is a home video camera, do we know that his time was exactly synced up with the time of day in the state's timeline? We we really don't. We're not sure. Um, Second of all, The state doesn't have to get boxed in on a timeline, and and that can be something tricky for prosecutors. They don't have to nail his death down to an exact second. They know, and they have a mountain of evidence showing this beautiful little boy died on January 27th. That's really all they need to do. Uh, We all know the language in um, when we see affidavits processed all over the country, on or about. January 27th, those are the magic words. So they don't need to prove it down to the hour. I think it was great this neighbor came forward and was so forthcoming, sharing that evidence. I hope that investigators can authenticate the tape and make sure the time is what they believe it to be. All right, another amazing moment in this interview that that Seema did is when um, Roderick Drayton, the neighbor's wife, I guess is listening to the conversation. yeah, she was great. And she jumps in, right? So, so we hear her, but I don't think we're going to see her. Let's take a listen to her describing Letitia Stauk. So when I came home from work and I looked over there, she was smiling. She was actually acting like she was at a barbecue. Because I was like, that's very strange. My son's missing. I'm over here acting like we're having a party. Because a lot of people came to the neighborhood to offer to look for Gannon. And she was out there smiling. And she was just enjoying the company and was just too relaxed. Not like a parent that was missing a child. Seema relaxed and in a good mood after yeah. after the child goes missing? Well, this is great. Okay, so Tamika is the MVP, and that's uh, Mr. Drayton's wife. So it's very interesting because this is now the 28th, okay? So the day of the incident, the murder is, and Julie's exactly right, they can change the date if they want, but the bottom line is they're putting it down as January 27th. So if we just go by that timeline, on January 28th, Roderick and Tamika go over to uh, the Stouch's ha- house, like outside, everybody's hanging out. And Roderick, they don't know each other very well, but he says to Letitia, hey, uh, my cameras can capture your home. Do you want me to look through my cameras? And she says no. And then Tamika said how she observed, because I said, what was her demeanor like? And uh, Tamika from the side of the camera said, I need to, you know, tell Seema what I observed. And this is 24 hours after the child is gone. Ted Rollins, this is the kind of evidence that you might not think, you know, some people look at it and say, well, you know, it's not a murder weapon. Jurors will understand this, and and jurors will, I think, latch onto this. The way she is acting and reacting when this child is presumably missing, and and it just does not make any sort of sense. Yeah, we saw it with Lori Vallow when her husband Charles was was shot and killed by her brother. She's out there laughing with the police officers. We saw it with Scott Peterson when he's leaning back in his initial um, uh, detective interview, trying to be cool, Mr. Cool. Jurors hate it. And they look into there and they say, what would I be doing right now if my son was missing, my stepson? I wouldn't be joking around. I would be freaking out, asking everybody for help. It doesn't look good. And and jurors absolutely hold it against them. Julie, the way you act and react is, is something, you know, jurors bring their common sense into the courtroom. And the common sense tells you 
If you're a stepmother and you're legitimately concerned, you're not going to be smiling and laughing uh, the day after an 11-year-old boy is missing. Uh, and, you, uh, and, and presumably now, if, if her story, I don't know what story she's going to go with, but if she's going with, I was just raped yesterday, I don't think she would be smiling either, but she was raped and, and an 11-year-old boy was abducted at gunpoint and she's acting like she's going to a, to a, to a backyard barbecue. Exactly, Vinny. No reason to smile in any of the scenarios that she laid out for police, the many, many different stories that this woman told. Um, Seem a great job getting that information from those folks because it's very telling. It tells us that Letitia Stouck had an inappropriate reaction and not just one inappropriate reaction. Uh, let's talk about how she fled to, you know, the child's missing and she goes to another state. That's inappropriate. How about on the 29th, two days later, when she was questioned by investigators, the woman needed to read from her notes. If that isn't an inappropriate reaction, I don't know what is. And I'll tell you one more. Paying for a fake polygraph test. Your child <laughs> yeah. goes missing because he doesn't come home from a friend's house and you're so concerned, but you got to go pay for the fake polygraph to show that you didn't do it. If I'm the prosecutor, I'm going to hammer home those two words. Inappropriate reaction for this jury all day long, Vinny. All right, we're going to adjourn this group for just a short time. We'll reconvene uh, when we bring in Lori and Chad Daybell tonight. Uh, we'll do that in a little bit. Uh, also, uh, coming up uh, straight ahead, folks, it's been just over two years since that horrible shooting down in Parkland. 17 victims shot and killed, 17 more injured. That case now getting ready for trial should happen this year. Chanley Painter has more when we come back.